when I was at Bell Laboratories in the early 1980s, um, I started talking socially with a, a scientist, a brilliant scientist named Arthur Ashkin. Um, and he was telling me about a dream that he had. And the dream was he wanted to hold on to neutral particles with light, but not the way you normally hold on to particles. And this is the way you normally hold on to particles. Here you have a marble. And if you magnify the interface between the finger and the marble, you would see that the electron clouds on the finger and the marble get distorted, and you actually begin to exert electromagnetic electrostatic forces. But here you see that you have to actually touch the marble. You have to get nearly atomically close to the marble in order to touch it. And Art Ashton didn't want to do it that way. He wanted to hold on to things by remote control and push things around the way, for example, we can push around electrons or protons. And there is an example of how one could do this, uh, and this is something you all know. If you take a charged rod and you hold it near a dust particle piece of paper, what we say is that the positive charges on this rod would uh, cause an electric field, and it would cause the charges on the dust particle or piece of paper to distort ever so slightly, so that on average, the charges the negative charges are a little bit closer to the positive rod than the positive charges. And um, the nice thing about this is if you happen to get positive charges in there, you see that uh, this particle will be attracted towards the rod. And, uh, and we say that you've induced some polarization on this particle. But now if you put on negative charges on the rod, the same thing will happen. Uh, these charges will then distort where the positive charges are closer to the rod. And again, you have an induced polarization along the direction of the electric field. There's a force pulling this into a region of high electric field. It's a very feeble force because the attractive force due to the positive charges on this particle is only slightly bigger than the negative force due to this because on average, this particle is neutral. Now, that's all fine and good. The particle gets drawn to the rod, but after that, the show is over because the particle is now touching the rod, and this is not what you want. But now you notice something here. The, um, the particle is always drawn to a region of high electric field. No matter whether the uh, rod is positive or negative, it's still high electric field. And so you say, well, that should be simple. All you have to do is design um, some clever distribution of charges so that there is an electric field maximum. And the problem is it's impossible to make a static electric field where there's a maximum if there's no material there. And so uh, that's something that um, when I teach freshman physics at Stanford, uh, I, I can take them through. It's a simple proof. But just take it as a given that if you want an electric field maximum, either you have to have a material object there or you can't. Um, fundamentally, the proof is actually very simple. There's field lines that are coming in and going out. And in a region space where there is no uh, material, the net flow of field lines in and out has to be the same, and from that you can then show quite simply that there can't be a field maximum. However, that's a theorem in static electricity. If you, for example, take a laser beam and focus the laser beam very tightly, what you'll find is that at the center point of this laser beam, you have an electric field maximum. Okay, it's not the same. It's a very rapidly oscillating electric field, but it's still electric field maximum. But you, going back to my example of the dust particle, you notice that if the field flips sign, flips direction, as long as the charges on that piece of paper or dust can keep in step with this rapidly changing electric field direction, it's still an attractive force. And so that's the idea, that uh, if you shine this light on this particle and the electrons on the particle, an atom or whatever, a little micron size sphere, if those electrons can move around fast enough to respond instantaneously, effectively instantaneously to the driving electric field, it wants to be in a region of high electric field. So this is a basic idea. Its roots actually went back to 1968. Uh, a Russian physicist, Ledikov, first thought about these ideas. Arthur Ashkin thought about these ideas. But the forces that you can exert on atoms, which was what people were thinking about in those days, was uh, really feeble, and, um, and an atom at room temperature in this room would fly by an electric uh, focused laser beam like this and you wouldn't feel anything. 
And so the next major trick that was needed was that you would have to get the atoms very cold and still be out there in, in a vapor form. And the way one does this is you use a technique called laser cooling. Here's an atom. It's traveling towards the right. You surround it by two beams of light. Every time uh, the particles of light hit this atom, they will scatter. And every time uh, the atom scatters this, these photons, it feels little momentum pulses, impulses. Now, in this arrangement, you'd think, well, there's no net force. But there is another thing you have to know, and that is when the atom is moving to the right, it doesn't really see the frequency of the laser, omega sub L. It, there's a effect called a Doppler shift, and so it sees a slightly higher frequency. And so here I've plotted the frequency of the atom. Well, this brown curve is the response of the atom to the light. That is to say, the probability that the atom will scatter a photon. Here we tune our laser at this frequency. But as far as the moving atom is concerned, it doesn't see that frequency from that beam. It sees a frequency that's slightly higher due to the Doppler shift. And it's running away from this frequency, so it sees a frequency that's slightly lower. And the beautiful thing about this idea is if the atom goes to the left, it scatters more photons from this beam than that beam. So you don't have to know which way the atom's going. No matter which way it goes, it will scatter more photons from the beam opposing its motion. Then once you have this idea, you can um, uh, generalize it to two and three dimensions. And you essentially surround this atom with laser beams. And no matter which way the atom goes, it sees uh, these two beams will slow it in that direction. These two beams will slow it in the other direction. And you can show that the force averaged over many photon scattering events will be something proportional to the velocity, but oppose, always opposing the velocity. So in this sense, we call it a viscous drag force. It's like you put a, uh, a little pebble into some thick molasses. And if you want to push that pebble to the right or the left, no matter which way it wants to go, it feels this viscous drag telling it to slow down and stop. And for that reason, uh, this thing was called, that is to say, surrounding the atom with many laser beams was called optical molasses. Uh, it was an idea that was suggested by Ted Hench and Arthur Shallow in 1975 in a very short uh, two-page paper. And in 1985, my colleagues and I were able to show that, yes, indeed, this can work. This is a picture of our vacuum apparatus at Bell Laboratories. What you see here are these beams of light, and they're just configured to actually do exactly what I just described to you, surround the uh, atoms with laser light. This, this, these dotted lines here is actually, it's a pulsed laser. And the way you make this picture is you take, a, you take two exposures. You take it when the lights are on. You get the vacuum can. Then you turn the lights off. And you run a white card along. And the light that scatters off of a white card is then shown up uh, in these things. And we had a pulsed laser going. As you scan the white card, you see the little pulses of light. You look inside the vacuum chamber, which is something we did not do for several weeks, because physicists always hide behind some instruments. And it never even occurred to me to look inside. But when you look inside, you actually can see the atoms with your eyes. And there's a little ball of atoms over here. And what has happened is they've been streaming out of here, going at the speeds of supersonic jet planes. They go into this crisscross region of laser beams. There's six of them. You don't see the laser beams because there's no air, there's no dust in here. The only time you see light is when the light from the laser beams is scattering from the atoms. And we can actually measure the velocity distribution of the atoms in here. We found a temperature of 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. So that work was done in 1985. And shortly afterwards, other groups uh, began to get their own optical molasses and measure temperatures. And things were looking pretty good for a few years. Uh, until about 1987, early, middle, late 1987 to 1988. And things were starting to go wrong in a very serious way. I think uh, Bill Phillips's group found that if you make the beams going from the right and left slightly imbalanced, you could calculate how fast the atoms should drift away. Uh, we found, you could also calculate how long the atoms should be stored. And we found that if you do things in a peculiar way, you could store them for an order of magnitude longer. And so as we started to talk amongst ourselves that you know, something is really wrong here, um, then Bill Phillips and his colleagues went back in the lab and said, well, let's make a much more careful 
um, look, ha let's have a more careful look at the temperature. And uh, what they found in a much more careful measurement where they made sure the magnetic field was much lower, what they found was that the temperature was not 240 microkelvin, but 40 microkelvin. Uh, that's big news because that was a factor of eight colder than what we thought the theoretical minimum temperature was. And that's always big news because when you do better than what theory says you do, uh, there's something you don't understand. And in fact, physicists are quite prepared to explain why you didn't reach the theoretical minimum. But when you do something like this, then uh, uh, it got all of our attention. Uh, Carl Wyman, Claude Condonugi, I immediately reproduced these results. And um, so we say that this is a strong violation of Murphy's Law. The, the cooling uh, was working in every way we can imagine better than it should have. And it turned out that simple explanation that uh, Ted Hench and Arthur Shallow had invented and then finally demonstrated, that simple explanation is only partially true. It's true when the atoms are moving fairly rapidly. But once they get down to these hundreds of microkelvin temperatures, some other effect takes over. Claude Quantinugi and a young colleague of his, Jean Dalibard, and I independently, within a few months, figured out really what was going on. Now, I should also tell you that in 1975, the same year that Hensch and Shallow proposed their Doppler cooling, there was another proposal by David Weinland and Hans Demel. This proposal was not a two-page paper. It was a one paragraph in an uh, American Physical Society bulletin. That's all it was. It was one of those, we think we know how to cool ions held in a trap to very cold temperatures, and that was it. Uh, now, what was the idea? If you have an ion, now this is a charged particle, but it's held very tightly in a, a trap, you can actually think of this particle oscillating back and forth in the trap really in terms of its quantum oscillator states. So these lines here, this is meant to show, this parabolic thing is meant to show the potential well of a particle trapped in this harmonic oscillator. And these lines are the first, second, third, and fourth ex states of the harmonic oscillator. And so what I'm drawing here now is an ion in its ground state and up an ion, the same ion, in the trap in the excited state. And so what Wineland and Damel proposed is you have your ion, and suppose you take a laser and you tune it so it goes from the third excited state, vibrational state of the ion, to the second vibrational state of the ion. And you just force it to make this transition. One can show in simple way that uh, once you're in this excited state and the atom spontaneously emits a photon, it doesn't really want to change vibrational levels. So think of the ion, it's shaking back and forth in a particular vibrational level. It's now excited. It's still shaking back and forth in, that, in a different vibrational level, but when it de-excites, it would rather go back to the same vibrational level. Uh, so, so see what you've done here. You've, you've gone down by one energy, vibrational energy, by this one absorption. But the same photon is can now excite the ion back up from the new equals two ground state to the new equals one excited state, and then it de-excites back down to new equals one. You lost another quantum unit, vibrational quantum unit of energy. You do it again with the same laser light. You don't even have to tune it differently. You go to the ground vibrational excited state, and it comes back down to the ground state. Now, at this point, magic occurs. You try to excite it up. There's no level to excite it. So it's perfect. You're shining light on it until it gets down to the absolute ground state, and then it becomes invisible to the light, and you've left it alone. So this was a wonderful idea, but it took, um, it took many years for the same group, uh, this is a group of Dave Wineland, to actually demonstrate this idea. Why did it take so long? Well, they thought when you were exciting the ion from this state to that state, you would have to hold the ion so tightly that the vibrational energy level, the spacing between here, is big enough so that you can actually clearly resolve that line. And so they had to work very hard in order to get a very tight trap. And so that took roughly 14 years. Now, um, it turns out that you didn't really have to do that. If you had an atom with two different ground states, 
for example, they have slightly different magnetic properties, and so they would have one ground state with its vibrational levels and another ground state with the same vibrational levels. And instead of using two, one photon, you use two photons, and you make a transition from the third vibrational state of one particular atom oriented a certain way into the second vibrational state of the atom oriented a way. You've still made this jump down. You then use a laser, excite it back up, and, it, and uh, you allow it to make a spontaneous emission back down, and you've done the same. But what's different? What's different is you're making transitions from one ground state to another ground state, and so you can take more time, and the line width problem is not an issue anymore, because by now you can control the lasers very well. So what you see is you can then cycle it back down, and then you end up with this atom in the ground state. So you didn't need to wait 14 years to make a tight ion trap. But in addition to that, you can do this with atoms now, because there's no way you can hold an atom so tightly as you could a charged particle, because remember, the forces on atoms are very feeble. So we and others have used this technique to actually cool neutral atoms in the same, uh, using essentially the same strategy that had been proposed in 1975. Um, but it works quite well, and in fact, it, if you plot as a function of what we call the phase space density, so this is a product of the density times a measure of how cold it is by the size of its, uh, qu by the quantum size. That is to say, the colder you get, the more the quantum wavelength gets bigger, and you take the cube of that, and that's what we call phase space density. That's important because if you want to get the Bose condensation, you need phase space density, something on the order of one. And the best optical molasses, pulling out all the tricks, uh, is roughly three orders of magnitude worse than this technique. But I should also say that not only did you not need to resolve the states, though you didn't need all the states to have be evenly spaced. And so what we found is the light just has to be tuned sort of in the right direction. It doesn't have to resolve anything, and you can still get this wonderful cooling. So here's another example where it worked much better than anybody ever thought it would. And, uh, but now we, we actually, if you thought about it a little harder, we, we, we should have understood it. Now, let me tell you uh, another way of cooling that's just emerged, which is um, something that uh, is another example of something that simply worked much better than it should have. Suppose you have the atom and you want to uh, cool it. Remember, in the olden days, what we would do is we would surround the atom with light. The atom is going this way and it would preferentially absorb from this beam and not from that beam, and that's why you'd slow it down. But you'd have to surround the atom on all sides. But there's something you can do, and uh, you can actually surround the atom with a set of two mirrors. And if you adjust the mirrors properly and make them highly reflecting, it turns out that the atom will no longer emit radiation in some isotropic way. There's no preferred direction the mirrors in the cavity will actually tell the atom, hey, emit along my axis. So this is an effect called quantum cavity electrodynamics, where by altering the boundary conditions around the atom, you can actually get the spontaneous, you can control the spontaneous emission. You can say, emit along the axis of the fabry pro This is this optical cavity. Now there's one other trick. You make this cavity resonant with slightly bluer light. So in addition to that, it would prefer to emit a bluer photon in the frame of reference of the cavity. So this is perfectly what you want. Here, this atom is going this direction. It prefer preferentially absorbs a photon from this, gets a kick in this direction, slowing it down. But then it looks around and says, where am I going to throw out this photon? I'm going to throw it in the cavity, and I'm going to throw it so it's preferentially bluer. Well, if it's bluer, you know, the energy is going to have to come from somewhere. You put in a red photon, you get out a blue photon. It comes from the kinetic energy of the atom. And so the bluer photon is the one it emits in this direction, coincident with its direction, and therefore it recoils in that direction. Now, you only need two beams instead of uh, six. Well, that's not a big deal. But what is a big deal is that by enhancing this photon emission, you actually no longer have to worry about the energy levels of the atom. Now, laser cooling requires very special energy levels, and this doesn't require anything. You just have to, because it's the cavity resonance that's telling the atom how to scatter photons. 
And this, so this was a beautiful idea invented by Vladin Vultek when he was in my lab as a postdoc. And so he set about to uh, try it when he became a professor. So here, here it is again. This is, this is the resonance curve. And remember before, in the very first slide, this was the probability of scattering a photon due to the atom's natural line width. Now this is the uh, response of this cavity to a photon. So what we do is we tune the light over here to the red, just as before, and you shine light on. And so the atom will absorb it, and then it, it uh, emits photons along this direction. But the line width of the atom is now replaced by the line width of the cavity, and you, in principle, can get much colder uh, temperatures. But mostly, you can, in principle, cool molecules, you can cool buckyballs, you can cool lots of things. The resonance structure of the atom is no longer important. Now, when this was first proposed, uh, there was a lot of, um, well, it may not work, and, yeah, it'll work for one atom, but it might not work for a bunch of atoms. And a couple of theorists told us that, well, it might work, but it might take infinitely long to cool, and, well, you know, there might be problems. And uh, so, undeterred, Vladin went ahead and he did the experiment. So the idea here is you use conventional cooling techniques to cool them, get them down to a couple 10 microkelvin, and then you drop them. They pick up speed and they fall into these beams, and here's our optical cavity, or his optical cavity, and he saw what happened. And in the uh, abstract of the paper, it says, the measured forces substantially exceed those predicted for this single two-level atom. It had worked orders of magnitude better than predicted. While it was cooling the atoms, coherent light was coming out of the cavity. It was like it was lazy. Okay? So this is the third time cooling has worked better than it should have. And um, uh, the verdict is not completely in, but the suspicion is the following. Here's these laser beams shining on a cloud of atoms. And one can show, as uh, discussed in this paper, that the atoms begin to self-organize into little pockets, but the little pocket, and they happen to, and you can show that they actually self-organize in every other little pocket. And because the atoms are being excited by coherent light, their self-organization spatially then uh, induces the atoms to emit light very directionally. So it's not only the cavity that's telling the spontaneous emission to go this way, it's the organization and the phase of the atoms which is telling it even harder to emit along the axis of the fabry perot and so this thing feeds on itself, and you get out coherent light, and the thing cools. Okay. I should also say that there's a, a final way of cooling that has nothing to do with light, but it's technically very important. And the idea is you have a collection of atoms. They're bouncing around. Some of them are hot. Some of them are cold. And uh, it, you know, if you take a high cup of coffee and blow on the top, you know you cool it down. But what's really happening when you cool it down? What you're doing is you're taking away a small fraction of the very hottest atoms, those that have enough energy to hop out of the liquid into the vapor. And the remaining molecules in your cup of coffee uh, are then, on average, considerably colder. And so what uh, these people showed is that if you then peel down the edge of your trap and allowed the very hottest atom or molecule to leave, and, but these others can thermalize and collide again, uh, then the remaining ones could be much colder. And this is very important because as you get to very, very cold temperatures, light essentially is very bad. The uh, two methods I talked to you about before are also based on the fact that once the atoms are getting very cold, they should become invisible to the light. And so with these techniques, if you summarize over the last couple of decades, uh, at room temperature, uh, where we're going to use a temperature scale, an absolute temperature scale, which is a measure of the average energy of the molecules in the room, for example. Here we are at room temperature, 300 degrees Kelvin. If you go to the surface of the sun, it's roughly a factor of 10 hotter than room temperature. That is to say, the atoms and ions on the surface of the sun have roughly a factor of 10 more average, more higher energy. Uh, if you go down by two orders of magnitude to where liquid helium, helium liquefies, in fact, if you go um, to the far reaches of the universe, far away from all galaxies, stars, everything, and you ask, uh, what's the temperature of the universe? 
uh, it's, we're, in, we're bathed in uh, a sea of photons at 3 degrees Kelvin. So in a certain sense, you can say that this is the natural cold temperature of our universe. And that's only a factor of 100 colder than room temperature. And so uh, with various cooling methods, we now have gotten um, 10 orders of magnitude colder than room temperature, 8 orders of magnitude colder than coldest natural temperatures. And so when we say cold, we really mean cold in a very serious way. And, um, and so then you say, OK, this is fine. You, you can show off. You can get atoms very cold. Uh, but what can you do with them? And of course, it turns out there were a lot of applications. I want to take you through several of these applications. Um, you can measure time with atoms. Well, of course you can measure time with atoms because any clock you're going to make is made out of atoms. And the first one, uh, the first good clock was invented by Galileo when he was a young man. The story goes at church and he was a little bit bored and he was noticing that a church lantern was rocking back and forth. And no matter which way it rocked back and forth, it seemed to measure uh, about the same amount of time. And actually, the story goes, continues to go. He used his pulse to see if that were true, which is very fanciful, because if you think onto something great, um, I think your heart tends to speed up. <laughs> but in any case, he never uh, got to make this pendulum clock, uh, because he started fooling around with telescopes and got involved with other issues. Uh, and so Huygens was the first to actually make this pendulum clock, uh, which is essentially a, something that's swinging back and forth, nice even motion. And a clock is something that just does periodic motion somehow and something to count the, the number of ticks. The reason pendulum clocks work so well is because the time it takes to go back and forth depends on only two things, really. It depends on the length of the string or bob and it depends on the acceleration of gravity. So it doesn't really depend on what the thing that's swinging back and forth is made out of. Um, and so uh, for the next 300 years, pendulum clocks were wonderful. They set the standard precision. I'm going to take one little detour and tell you some history. And the history was, uh, in terms of navigation issues, um, what happened is when British sailors were sailing all about, uh, let's say, the West Indies, uh, they um, would then come back to England, and uh, a disaster happened in 1714. Four ships of the British Navy ran aground, and 2,000 men died because they didn't know where they were. And by the time they saw the cliffs, the currents just took them in. And so this was a disaster, and Queen Anne offered 20,000 um, pounds. If someone could figure out a way of navigating so that you can have an accuracy of maybe two nautical miles, um, so that was the challenge. Um, the issue was longitude. Latitude you can find because by look, using a Stetson and other things, you can measure the height of the sun during the day, certain times, the height of stars during night. So you knew where you were in terms of latitude, but because the Earth spun around, uh, you have a longitude problem. Um, it turns out that a clock can be used to find out where you are in longitude, and it's something you're all familiar with. Uh, for example, you're, it's noontime in the West Indies, and the sun is high, uh, but it doesn't feel like noontime. It, you're very sleepy. Why? Because your biological clock is set at Greenwich time. You know, there's some boat lag, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so, so the idea is as follows. You have a very good biological clock. It's a chronometer. And you set it to Greenwich time. And you look at noontime West Indies, but your clock at Greenwich time is 7.35 and 15 seconds PM. And it needs to be roughly that accurate within a couple of seconds, within a few minutes, really, in order to, to achieve the accuracy. And uh, so then you know what noontime is, and then you know roughly what the size, pretty precisely, actually, what the size of the Earth is. And so you can actually do that. So uh, a carpenter, John Harrison, figured this out. And this was version, I think, 2 or 1. Uh, the actual ship's chronographer was this thing. It looks like a large pocket watch. And so with this, it was uh, fantastic. It was good to 6 seconds per month. And uh, from there, you can actually navigate the seas. You can find the islands of the South Pacific. A very similar one was used by Captain Cook. This was a very important strategic technology that was guarded jealously by the British because that gave them the power to rule the seas. 
pendulum clocks got better and better, and there was a slow move, a slow Moore's law for the next 300 years. Uh, every century, they would improve by roughly an order of magnitude. And um, and then something happened. In around 1950, atomic clocks were invented, and the Moore's law sped up a little bit, and so things started to improve by a factor of 10 every 10 years. What's the idea of an atomic clock? Well, an atom has a ground and excited state, and if you're shining the right radiation attuned to this atom, you get the atom to go in the excited state. So this is all very fine and good. What's really nice about it is an isolated atom is a very beautiful clock, and so you can have some man-made thing shining radiation on the atom, but you don't really care about it because you can constantly adjust it and because it's always referenced back to the atomic frequency. So, uh, so here's an atom, it wishes by, this is a little cavity which is going to shine electromagnetic radiation on the atom. And it's going really, the atom's going really fast. So there's a, a principle in physics called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle which says the measurement time delta t times the uncertainty in the energy that you're going to measure is going to be greater than or equal to a fundamental constant called Planck's constant. And so what happens is that if the atom just wishes through this cavity, it takes about a millionth of a second for it to fly through, not very much time to measure it. And so what Norman Ramsey did is he invented a method which goes through two cavities. And I'm going to skip uh, the details, but just suffice it to say the measurement is done partly here, partly there, and it's the transit time that allows uh, the atom to make a measurement. And that measurement time now has been increased by several orders of magnitude. Okay, with cold atoms you can do even better. You can take your atoms, you can toss them up, they turn around due to gravity, and now it takes a full second for them to go up and come down, and you can make a much better measurement. And so when, um, when I was a graduate student in Gene Cummins' group, I heard as an atomic physicist, I heard about this brave attempt by Zacharias at MIT to make an atomic fountain roughly in 1950. And he failed because, uh, he, well, he couldn't make the atomic fountain because the slow-moving atoms that were going to turn around were kicked out of the way by the fast-moving atoms coming up from behind. They thought of that, but they didn't realize that the probability of a collision was so high. And so they failed. But once you have laser cooling and trapping technologies, you can do this. You can toss them up, they turn around. While they turn around due to gravity, you can make an, a, a very nice measurement. This is the first one. This is a more recent version uh, built by the people in the Bureau of Standards, the equivalent of the Bureau of Standards in France, where you have atoms here uh, cooled down to microkelvin temperatures, thrown up, they turn around due to gravity and come back down. This distance is about one meter. And over a period of six, seven years, the atomic fountains improved dramatically, so now they're actually about 15 decimal places accurate. So what that means is if you start one of these atomic clocks when you were born and you, get, you ask it by the time you're 80 years old what time it is, you will know what time it is to a few millionths of a second. And if you ask when the, oh, the age of the universe has gotten a little younger, since I made this transparency, it's maybe 12 billion years old. <laughs> and uh, so it's a slightly less than, you would know what time it is from the age of the universe started, if you can protect the atomic clock from being blown up, uh, by a few minutes. And so that's pretty good. Uh, in fact, you might say that's too good. And, uh, and why are my tax dollars paying for this? And um, <laughs> The reason they, your tax dollars are paying for this is the most precise measurements in science are frequency measurements. The distance is measured in how long it takes a light beam to travel a certain amount of time. So it's, we're in a very peculiar situation now. The speed of light is a defined thing. Okay? And, so, and the time is defined in terms of number of cycles of a particular atom, cesium. And so how far does light travel, is, that defines a meter. Because of some condensed matter effects, if you put, take two superconductors, put them loosely together, and put a voltage on it, you get a frequency. And so voltage is now defined in terms of frequency, which is now tied back to the atomic clock. So in many cases, our fundamental units are actually now defined in terms of the time standard.
So the time standard is like the stake in the ground, and everything is referenced to this. And for the same, uh, for an, it turns out that the most accurate measurements are always frequency measurements. And it, it's simple. Um, we know how to count better than we know how to do anything else, because counting is the most simple thing you can do. It's one, two, three, four. It's much better, and that's what all time is, counting and logging in how many ticks there are. And, um, and it's much simpler than measuring the color red or a specific heat. There's still this one-to-one -one correspondence between navigation and time. In the days of uh, ships sailing around the world, uh, uh, it was the chronometers. But now we have global positioning satellites that allow us to triangulate, and we can tell anywhere where we are anywhere in the world to about a meter. And so this is useful for navigation of ships, airplanes, cars, tractors in the Midwest also know uh, landmarks, so they can get lost. Um, actually, so they can plow lines in very straight things. Um, and they can be used for measuring the height, ocean heights uh, as a reference. That is the ocean height relative to the center of mass of the Earth as the polar caps melt. The, um, due to perhaps global warming, then the sea rises. It's true. It's rising. Uh, it's also true that the globe is warming, I think. And it's also used, atomic clocks are used in synchronization of high-speed data. Things are getting better due to techniques, laser cooling and trapping methods, control of lasers, and most recently we can now count optical frequencies directly. We can get, we think we're going to get down to 10 to the minus 18 in a few years. That's going to be very exciting because um, some, we can begin to ask very precisely, for example, are the fundamental constants changing in time? Are they, or are they really constant? But uh, with, uh, actually we couldn't dream of before. Very closely related experiments that used atomic clocks are used to split atoms and bring them apart. Atoms are part matter, part wave, and if you put an atom through a little slit, it will diffract like an atomic wave, and you can actually have these waves interfere and make interference fringes. And so in 1991, uh, several groups within a month published uh, four atom interferometers using these, these techniques, which are based on direct analog of an atom diffracting off of a physical object. Uh, we were one of those groups, but we had, did something slightly different. We um, used pulses of light to control an atom. Suppose an atom is coming along, and you hit it with one pulse of light, and it absorbs, and you stimulate back down with another pulse of light, and it goes in the same direction. And you can use these pulses of light to actually split an atom. Uh, for example, an atom coming along here can be put in a combination of states, both the initial state and the state which now has two impulses of light. And so quantum mechanics says that the atom actually separates and begins to deviate, where part of the atom is here and part of the atom is there. You use another pulse of light, you turn them around, and you join them back. And uh, these, the, the atomic wave along this direction and the atomic wave along this direction actually interfere, and you can actually use that to measure something. For example, if the atoms are falling due to gravity, you can actually measure how fast they fall. Another way of looking at this is here's the atom wave, and, and the wavelength is a measure of its, uh, the frequency or the wavelength of this atom is a measure of how energetic it is. And as you see, as this atom climbs up this potential due to gravity, its wavelength is getting slightly longer. And over here, its wavelength is long, and over here, it's short. So this path will see fewer cycles than this path path where it's cycling very fast. This path and this path are the same, so it's really the difference between this path and this path. There are more cycles here than here. And so by doing that, then the phase interference will actually could preferentially send the atom up here or that way, depending on how they interfere, either constructively or destructively. Uh, so you use this technique and you can watch how atoms drop. Uh, it works pretty well. This is a measurement of atoms dropping in our laboratory over a two-day period. Uh, each dot is a measurement over one minute, uh, so there's a bit of scatter. Uh, you notice that gravity's changing. It's not changing by much. And uh, we then compare the changes in gravities to models of how gravity should change on Earth. 
And the reason it changes is the Earth is an elastic solid, and as it goes around the sun and moon, it kind of flexes, and you go further, closer away from the center of, gra uh, center of the Earth. And so those are the so-called tidal forces that actually mean the acceleration in gravity changes. We compared it to two models. The red curve is a model which just models the Earth as an elastic solid. And the blue curve is the best you can do. It models the Earth as an elastic solid, but because it's an elastic solid, the water moves around. And so as the water comes in, this is the tidal forces of, do, that cause the tides to come in, the water presses down on the tectonic plates in Palo Alto, and we sink down about a centimeter. And if you model that and put in the appropriate delay, because the model was written for San Francisco, uh, you get this blue line. And so the tidal variation goes away. So here we have a precision fit of this to uh, 100 parts in a trillion. Again, you think, OK, you're just showing off. But here is actually a practical application. This is actually a map of, we didn't make this map. It was made actually with a spring balance, believe it or not. It's um, contour changes in gravity uh, over the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula, and each contour is one part in a million change in gravity. If you put this contour map on your PC, you can get this beautiful thing. This is low gravity. These points over here are high gravity. And right here, in low gravity, they went in there and they did something. Well, what did they do? Uh, they drilled for oil. Why? Because if you here's the Earth, and if you have solid rock, that's high gravity. If here's the Earth, and you have a big hollow place here, or some rock with oil in it, which is going to have lower density, it's low gravity, and you're hoping that you're going to hit oil. Uh, so this is the first pass way to look for pockets of oil is to measure gravity anomalies. And what you're looking for is you're looking for low regions of low gravity. Let me tell you another reason why you would want to do this. Um, here's an airplane, and they have a gravity sensor. Again, it's a, it's a primitive spring balance. It's not so primitive. It costs about a million dollars. But it's, um, or 300,000 for this one. And uh, what, it, what you do is the plane's bouncing up and down. Okay, now the height of the plane is measured by global positioning satellites, and you can reference that out to a resolution of a, a centimeter. Then you put on this uh, very good inertial sensors to take out the local accelerations due to the, the plane. Okay, so the global positioning satellite tells you positions, but you can't actually tell the difference in gravity and acceleration. So you need GPS. But then with that and, and the, the inertial sensors, you can begin to you can begin to pick up what's a real gravitational change due to density in rock and what's due to the bouncing up and down of the plane. And so what they did is they flew around in Australia and they flew around a diamond mine, which is a, a, a low point in gravity as well, and they hear this big signal. And here on land, they, they plotted out this contour and it took three weeks to plot out the gravity signature for a diamond mine. And in the air, they, they found they could get this, essentially the same signature in three minutes. Now, when they first did this, the uh, people were very skeptical. They said, well, yeah, you knew it was there, and so you just flew around and you could find it. Uh, but tell us something you didn't know. So they went back to the drawing board. They improved their algorithm a little bit better by factor three. They flew around. They got other signatures in Australia, but they're not telling anyone where they are. Now, it turns out that um, you can do this uh, with atoms, and you can do this by actually separating. So you drop atoms in this region and that region. You just drop them at the same time. And uh, uh, a former student of mine, actually the student who first worked on these gravity measurements, uh, is now doing this at Stanford. And he thinks that uh, you can actually put something in an airplane, and you get about a factor of 100 improvement over what currently exists. Actually, it's getting quite serious because this is now the beginnings of a full axis. It's about the size of my fist. A full axis, uh, this is one unit. Actually, he now has a three-axis acceleration, three-axis rotation about the size of this, powered by diode lasers all packed into a little box that is going to be put in a Trident summary. Because things have gotten so good with atom interferometry that they are now become, they've exceeded the best resolution of laser gyros for example, in the gyroscope. And it is already the best measure of the acceleration due to gravity. And this is only in a, in a decade. Uh, one other application due to this man, uh, Albert Einstein. He had predicted long, long ago 
that if you have atoms and they bounce on each other, well, they just bounce like atoms. But as they get colder, they begin to slow down. And because of the quantum mechanics of them, they begin to look like big fuzzballs. That quantum wavelength is getting to be bigger and bigger. And they get slower, they get even bigger fuzzballs. And if they get really slow, what's going to happen is the quantum wavelength, due to the uncertainty of where the atom might be, if that becomes comparable to the interatomic spacing, what he said was something really weird is going to happen. All these separate fuzzballs condense into one giant fuzzball. Okay, so what that means is the atoms, you know, a fuzzball here and here and here, all condenses to exactly the same thing. So it's not like soldiers all falling in line and marching in the same direction. It's like all the soldiers falling in line to like one gigantic soldier. Okay? All, so each, each atom is now part of a gigantic wave function. They're all the same. It has the same position, momentum, everything. Okay? And so um, this was actually demonstrated uh, by Air Cornell Carl Wyman. Uh, here you have atoms at a very balmy temperature, about 40 billionths of a degree above absolute zero. And as soon as you get a little bit colder by a factor of two, then there's this growing spike. Here you have the average energy of the atoms in this direction, this direction, evenly spread out. But here the atoms are condensing into a single quantum state that then mirrors what the potential, the, what you're holding the atoms with, this little potential well, which is asymmetric in their case. And so the the momentum distribution of the atoms was also asymmetric. And you get still colder, and you get more and more of them climbing into this single state. OK, so now here's all the atoms are in, um, most of the atoms here are now in a single quantum state. And uh, these properties now can be directly measured. And uh, for example, you can take this blob of atoms in Bose condensed state, separate into two Bose condensates, and they'll now come together. And remember, this is a single quantum wave, a single quantum wave. They come together, even though they're made up of many atoms. You can see beautiful interference fringes with these atoms. You can take this blob, and you can stir it up. You can take a little light finger, and you actually just stir, as you would a soup. And when you stir this little blob, you actually uh, put in units of angular momentum that turn up as little vortices, vortices little dimples that form a lattice. Okay. Another amazing thing, you can take this and you can make little checkerboards of potential wells by beating light against itself. So now you have an egg carton checkerboard. And if you cool down to these low temperatures, what you find is predicted again more than a decade ago, that the atoms will condense into a state where there's exactly one atom, one atom, one atom in each well, or two, 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 not sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes three. So it becomes extremely well ordered, and they just sit there. And each of the atoms in this little potential well, because the number is exact and determined, the poor phase of the atom, another uncertainty principle, is wildly indetermined. Okay? And then you lower the potential wells a little, and then you run around like superfluid. And so you, this is a, what we call a quantum phase transition that uh, has now been shown in the last couple of years. OK, in closing, you can not only cool down atoms, you can hold on to glass beads, as I said before, because it's the same forces. It's this less than static electricity. You can hold on to beads in water. And uh, this we actually did. This was done in Art Ashkin's lab at Bell Labs as a test, a pilot run for our atom trapping experiment, because this was a lot easier. After all, a bead is a lot, a polystyrene sphere, one micron in diameter, is a lot easier to handle than atoms in this fancy optical molasses. It's just water. And so Art found that, yes, you can trap them, and it was, worked great. And, uh, and uh, in a few months, we got our atoms to trap in a single focus bead. And Art went on to do other things. He could, for example, trap bacteria and move the bacteria around. He could opticute the bacteria, turn up the laser light, and they would explode. Um, I couldn't do that, because by then I was leaving to go to Stanford, and students would protest. So, so I said, OK, we can hold on to single cells and beads, we can hold on to atoms, can we hold on to something in between? And so I set about to learn enough molecular biology to uh, glue polystyrene spheres, little plastic spheres, onto the ends of a single DNA molecule. And so the, think of the spheres as little handles, and you can hold on to them. And you can look in an optical microscope at what you're doing, but you can put um, 
dye molecules on the molecule. And so this is an example of some stuff done around 1990. This is a single molecule of DNA. This is our polystyrene sphere. We hooked a laser beam up and it's being steered by motorized mirror mount and we put it on a joystick. And so the students felt really at home um, with this. <laughs> and uh, in fact, when we first got this, my two students who were working on this disappeared in the lab for, for several hours. They just didn't come out. And it was, they were just playing video games. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, now you notice that there's this long, that thing looked, there's this long skinny molecule and when you stretch it out and you let go of it, it begins to spring back like a rubber band. And so I said, well, holy smokes, why does it look like a rubber band? And it's because rubber bands are made up of long skinny molecules. And when you stretch them out, you put them in a state they don't like to be, they'd rather like to be randomly coiled in some irregular shape. And so, um, with that, I said, well, we can do some polymer physics with this. I was going to do some biology with this, but I got sidetracked. Um, and, uh, and for example, in this, I don't know if it sh yes, shows up. This is a slightly different experiment. It's the single molecule DNA, but it's in a background filled with um, other invisible molecules of DNA that are not stained. And you notice something about this molecule. It's not acting, it's, it's when it relaxes like it's rubber band, it's actually following the path defined by its topology. If you did this in a normal fluid, like some viscous fluid, it wouldn't do that, it would just kind of uniformly collapse down. And so this idea uh, was called reptation, it was something that had, was suggested by Dijen, and, and you can actually make this, this appear in the cover of science, you can actually put in an R for reptation and as this molecule relaxes back down. It, it, it's trapped in a tube defined by the topology of the molecule. So uh, we've done other things. I, I just want to say in one experiment, we watched how molecules stretch in a fluid. And in, the details are important. The most important thing is that a molecule placed in, in, in this condition would sometimes stretch. The same molecule put in identical condition the next time around would not stretch. You put it back, it would stretch again. And in fact, it would, so it, is, it acted like an individual and it, and it acted like it had moods. Now, so this is very weird because how can identical simple molecules, simple molecules of DNA placed on identical conditions act as an individual? And so Dijen, it got took notice, he said, this, how can molecules act as individuals? Here are individuals, but we're really very different. Uh, this is my older brother, this is my younger brother, this is me. Uh, he's much richer than both of us. He's the lawyer. So, <laughs> uh, but now the reason we're different, we're individuals, we have many degrees of freedom. Well, I don't know about freedom, but we have many variables. Uh, and, and, uh, and so because we have so many variables that, control, that describe our behavior, it, it can be muddled up. But simple molecules, maybe not. And so when we published this paper, we got the usual scientific reactions to scientific discovery, we were told it was wrong. And then after people began to figure out what it was, they said, oh, it's trivial. And then, and then, and perhaps a little later, we were reminded we weren't the first to discover it. <laughs> uh, this is standard. <laughs> um, you just remember, uh, if you're onto something big, you will see this reaction. If you're onto something not as big, they don't react at all. <laughs> uh, now, it turns out that it is trivial. Uh, what happens is the molecules in some random orientation and the flow we put on it was one that squishes in one dimension and extends in another dimension. And so we had this cartoon which we drew and then with Photoshop you can just squish it. Actually with PowerPoint you can do the same. And, uh, and then finally the flow goes into this and when it's in this state it doesn't know which way to unravel. Whereas if you take that same random coil and just rotate it by 90 degrees, what you find is it's going to go into this state. And so this unravels much more quickly. So that was our idea, and then we worked with uh, a polymer theorist who does computer simulations and showed, yes, indeed, we can explain quantitatively all the measurements we made based on the fact that the random condition, it starts off randomly, and as long as the fluid flow is changing fast enough so this molecule is trapped in its initial state, so it doesn't have time to wiggle around and find a thermal equilibrium, you get into these very diverse behaviors, okay? 
So the molecule was out of equilibrium. And it was showing individualism because it was simply out of equilibrium. But it was out of equilibrium in a process that was taking several seconds. Okay, what about biology? Well, most of biology, first of all, is not in equilibrium. Okay? And uh, you know what equilibrium is. It's when you die. Now you're returning to equilibrium. Okay? And certain, the chemical reactions, there's these big macromolecules, and something happens over here. You hydrolyze ATP, and, and things have got to move. So equilibrium chemistry may not tell us all that it's going to tell us. Also, most of what we learned in chemistry and biology has been determined by bulk studies. So could you have missed something? And so by the middle 90s, I'm, we've, we're finding we missed a lot with polymers. We missed the whole individualism. The irony is that people's computer simulations were getting good enough that with computer simulations, they could have discovered molecular individualism, but because there were no experiments, they averaged the results in the computer because that's all you could measure in the lab. And so when we first started talk, working with Ron Larson, he was giving us average results and said, no, 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 we want to know what the distributions are because we can now see them. And he said, oh, really? I never, I don't want to do that. Maybe I'll wait until I hire my first graduate student. But now I actually he didn't. He started looking because he was actually very curious. But, but this is something that's, that's really deeply embedded in us, that w when we can only make measurements of averages, we, can, we, we only think of averages. So just to summarize, here we started in 1983-84 thinking of ways to just cool atoms. And not really, the, I knew of only one application, what I knew as a graduate student, that you could make an atomic fountain make better clocks. And that came to pass very quickly. And these are the best atomic clocks in the world today. But I wasn't thinking about atom interferometers and measurements of gravity and inertial guidance systems. Uh, Bose condensation looked too fanciful. And although the, you, one pays lip service to it, it wasn't real until the mid-90s. And then finally, uh, with Carl Wyman and Eric Cornell, it became real. Um, certainly wasn't thinking of um, this stuff, holding on to individual molecules. And the idea of holding on to and manipulating individual molecules then led us and others, uh, this in the late 80s, early 90s, into really studying the behavior of single molecules. And what you'll hear about tomorrow is, in some detail, uh, at least part of the talk, we'll be describing how this particular machine, the ribosome, reads messenger RNA and makes proteins. But it's not as in picture diagrams of how it might do it, it is now being understood in terms of physics and chemistry. And once one understands how it's doing, all the many steps that biologists had an inkling what it was doing now appear to be a very elegant solution with the minimum number of steps. So it looks like it's exquisitely engineered and you couldn't have invented anything better if you tried for a billion years. So. Um, so I think uh, with that, I will stop. And I just want to say that this really has been a random walk, and it continues to be random because we don't really have any side of where we're going next. Thank you.